we forget very fast. Never mind we when we forget very fast also. But we remember when it is very convenient, we quote very easily from all those people. We suggest what all they said to us and how we are following. That is the thing. Now the third gentleman who is also unable to be present here because of health reason, he is also past 85, who took part in the Indian Naval Mutiny, a very, very ordinary sailor who joined as an ordinary able hand and rose to the position of chief periodist when he retired. He lives in Thiruvallur district, not Madras. He was jailed, he was imprisoned after the mutiny. And he, as a very, very ordinary seaman, a sailor, an able hand, was in the cell and he had a photograph of Mahatma Gandhi in his cell. When he was to be released, he was asked to remove the Gandhi's photograph from the cell. He replied, I will not. Then the government said you have to serve another 10 days in the jail. He said, I am prepared to spend another 10 days in jail rather than remove Gandhi's photograph. There was a kind of man who is not very well to do, lives in North Metro, who wanted to bring Mr. Andi here, please here. Andi who is the Secretary of Veterans Siemens Association, has been looking after that part of the story. And he was to bring him, unfortunately, he got a bit of diarrhea last night, so he couldn't come. Thank you. So I will be now, because a lot of people do not even know what Indian level mutiny was. And to quote Clement Attlee, much after independence when he visited India, he was asked by the governor of West Bengal, no lesser person than governor of West Bengal, what eventually got the freedom for India? Was it quit India moment of 1942? He burst his lips and said, no, definitely not. Then what? He said, never mutiny did. Because he understood that when the armed forces will not be us, there is nothing we can do in this country. We just can't control the people when the forces are not with us. We can manage politicians, but not a force which refused to obey. That was his statement. Because Clement Attlee was the Prime Minister when this mutiny took place. Now, I will start with the Royal Indian Naval Mutiny and you can just see how it all generated. What happened? Really, incidentally, it was a time when Indian National Army leaders were court martial and the case was going on in the Red Court. As you all know, Jawaharlal Nehru himself argued for people and it seems at that time when the country was in a turmoil, when the people knew we were going to get freedom, and there is still some time left, but there was adamant English people like Churchill and all who never wanted to give up the show because at that time. So you can see the backdrop of that. The forgotten chapter of independence struggle is the naval mutiny. The history of the mutiny starts like that. On January 16, 1946, a contingent of 67 ratings of various branches arrived at Carson Barracks, Mint Road in Port. Mumbai. Fossil Barracks was then named as HMIS Dalhousie. Later changed to the name of Ayana Sangri after the Admiral Angri, after the after Admiral Angri of Maratha uh, 3. So it was on January 16, 47 ratings, 67 ratings of different branches were drafted and sent to this barracks and they were given really bad food. The contingent that had arrived from the basic training establishment HMI Zarpur, HMI Zarpur was a base training establishment, not a ship, located at Tardi, a suburb of Mumbai, at 4 in the evening when they arrived, they were hungry, but there was no food. The officer on duty informed the galley, galley is kitchen, to as galley stopped at this arrival and wanted them to give them food, but they were given tasteless bread and watery curry to have. On that day, only 17 ratings ate the watery stuff. Press refused to eat. 50 of them said, we are not going to eat this. This was a 
star and they went ashore and gave. When report to the senior officers present, this grievance has practically evoked no response at all and the discontentment continued to build. This is how it started on 16th January 1946. And the snowballing effect of bad servicing conditions, bad service conditions. Already there was a widespread discontent among the ratings due to unequal treatment of whites and Indians. Whites were always given different missing. There were rations were different. European rations were different from Indian rations. And they were given better food. In spite of representation, nothing much was done to redress their grievances. Political leaders were busy with their engagement of dialogue with British government on various issues. No political leaders could even address the problem of sailors. The treatment of Indian National Army was also a point at that point of time because they were all being fought martial. Organization of the mutiny or later known as strike. The Orient mutiny started as a strike by ratings of the Royal Indian Navy on 18th February in protest against general condition. There was no specific condition, all general condition. The immediate issues of the mutiny were conditions of living and food. Conditions of living, specific conditions of living and food. By dusk on 19th February, a naval central strike committee was elected. Just look at that. There was no organization. There were no political leaders. There were no, nobody to lead them. But the discontentment was so, so uh, sort of strike that they could easily do it by themselves. Leading seaman Dennis Khan and Petty Officer Telegraphist Maran Singh were unanimously elected president and vice president respectively, happening in force. You can imagine it's some kind of thing unheard of. These two gentlemen, leading seaman Dennis Khan and Petty Officer Telegraphist Maran Singh, both were from communication run. There is another added point. Because they were from communication department, they could communicate with other establishments, other ships very easily. Within minutes, they could pass on the message as to what was happening. HMAS Talwar was again a base establishment. Talwar, as you know, means sword. HMAS Talwar, His Majesty's Indian ship Talwar was the signal training ship of Royal Navy, where normally they start with more sword and go to telegraphist and all the wireless telegraphy and other things. A Hathal by the ratings of the ship on 18th February 1946. Snowball in their mutiny by the Navy personnel of the Royal Indian Navy because they could trans, uh, transform all the messages to everybody else. The mutiny spilled over to other ships and even on the streets of Bombay. Mind you, the ships in Karachi, the ships in Baizar, HMS Adayar, which was inside the port, now it's of course outside, a shore establishment, and almost all ships in every port received the message that a strike was. The Union Jack was loyal from them. While the political leaders were striving hard to bring down the loyal Union Jack, these people very comfortably removed the Union Jack and brought it down. And they flew tricolor. Communications. As the strike started by trained signalmen of the Navy, it was easy for them to communicate with other establishments and spread the news without any problem. This was one plus point of the strike. As the atmosphere was already highly sensitive, the message caught on. Very easily caught on and people started listening to these two gentlemen. Same day, almost all ships and establishment joined the strike, which was a great shock to the ruling group because it could have never happened in any other sector. Textile sector took the strike. Various other sectors took the strike, but they could never do like this, this kind of coordination as they could because they were with the signal point. As recorded by a British officer, a British officer, Jack Gibson, a renowned educationist, actually was a teacher in Doon School, who was serving in Doon School, as recorded that the British officers were too insensitive to the needs of Indian sailors. A British officer himself was recorded. He was drafted to serve as RINBR. RINBR means Royal Indian Navy Voluntary Reserve. They are recruited, they are sent because they were short of officers. He being a Britisher, he was sent to the 
join a ship as an officer. In his book, As I Saw It, the book is titled As I Saw It. It's, uh, I don't think it is available now in the stall, but uh, you can get total book in PDF format in uh, the internet. According to him, the British officers were either too stupid to see or too lazy to care. This was what exactly recorded by a British officer. They were either too stupid to see or too lazy to care, as written by in his book. Morale was too low and the English were too great for that. That's what he said. Memoirs of Jack Wilson in India, an Indian Englishman. When he was teaching in Doom School, he joined the Royal Navy, as I said, in July 1942. He was given leave by the school to serve in the Navy. On 15th January 1944, he joined Feroz. Feroz was an establishment for newly recruited officers to be trained and positioned on the Malabar Hill, a training establishment. That is very important, the conditions are falling. Even there, he formed such a lot of difference between Hungary and India. That is that Jackson. What did follow up after that? The strike found immense support among the Indian population. Already gripped by the stories of the Indian National Army. Already people were talking about Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, Captain Lakshmi, Dillon, and Khan, and various other people who were already undergoing trials, and they were all against the British one way or other. They were so happy that Indian Navy started the mutiny. The actions of the mutineers were supported by demonstration which included a one-day general strike in Bombay. Bombay started with one-day general strike and day Bombay was shut down for one day. The strike spread to other cities and was joined by the Royal Indian Air Force and local police. Even Bombay police joined the strike. This is what gave the complete shock to the British. They knew now they can't do anything. But Britishers were well organized. The naval officers and men began calling themselves the Indian National Navy. They renamed themselves within one day as Indian National Navy. In the streets of Bombay, you can see this is only one photograph available on the slide in the streets of Bombay. You can see here, you can see here sailors. You can see sailors with deck cap, you know, deck cap sailors, those that was the uniform of those days and joined by the common public and going in the streets of Bombay. This was something which was so spontaneous that the administration was taken by surprise. The discontent spread. Soon thousands of discontent ratings from Mumbai, Karachi, Kachin and Vishakhapatnam joined them. All these people joined immediately. See, all this thing happened within about 32 hours. Within 32 hours of the start, starting of the strike. And I don't think today we can do that in an all India basis, you know, within 32 hours, very kind of uh, thing. They communicated with each other through the wireless communication sets available in HMS Talwar, thus the entire world was completely coordinated. The unrest spread to the shore establishment from the initial from the initial flash point in Bombay to Karachi and Calcutta involving 78 ships. 20 shore establishments and totally 20,000 sailors. Within the second day, this was absolutely standstill. This has never happened in any part of uh, the world. The total mutiny. Other naval mutinies, we reported Australian naval mutiny and all that, it was very, very partial, nothing to do with the entire Navy. Even if you see the only well known mutiny is mutiny on the Bauti, that was based on two factors, though it is a normal. What followed after that? The next morning, the tricolor was hoisted by the ratings on most of the ships and establishment. In fact, in some of the ships, they not only tricolor, they hoisted the flag of Muslim League and Communist Party of India. Communist Party of India. At that time, it was a one Communist Party of India. And they raised the flag of Communist Party of India because that was the only party which supported the strike. The third day was charged with fresh emotions. Sadar Patel's statement of assurance did improve matters considerably. It is at this time our political leadership felt that it is going out of everybody's control. Mahatma asked Sadar Balwai Patel. Sadar Balwai Patel came and stood in the portico in front of Gateway of India 
and ask the native people to give up the strength. It was Sadha Manuvai Patel here and in Kalkata and Muhammad Ali Jinnah on behalf of Muslim people. Both of them requested the sailors to give up the strength. However, an unruly gun thrown of a, of a 25 pounder gun, a 25 pounder gun is a shell which is weighing 25 pounds. It was fired from a ship which had some sailors who were unruly, who were not coordinating with the general strike, people like Khan and others. They let go one shell into Bombay Dock. It blasted off from Banyan Tree. It uh, blew up a large branch of an old Banyan Tree in the dry dock. By this time, the British destroyers fully armed to go into action, arrived and had positioned themselves off the gateway of India in Mumbai. <coughs> also in Karachi, Royal Naval destroyers came around and surrounded all these ships from all sides. There was always a difference between an organized attack and an unorganized or more than a disorganized way of discipline. The rulers now act. The Orient military was treated as a crisis of the empire by an alarm the British cabinet. Clement Attlee ordered the Royal Navy to put down the revolt. That was the first time he went down and he also, also that is uh, available in record, the statement that he made in the parliament that you should give a strike. He gave very clear warning. Admiral Godfrey, the flag officer commanding the Orient, went on the air with his order, submit or perish. This is an order normally only when warring navies are under attack from each other. And when one navy is winning over other, the order is given, submit or perish. So this order was given by Royal Navy to Royal Indian Navy in Bombay War. But this is something which is unique, which has never happened anywhere before. The next day, the RAF, Royal Air Force threatened the uh, defiant Orient ship by flying a squadron of bombers low over Bombay Harbor. Even as Admiral Radway, flag officer Bombay Oregon, issued an ultimatum asking the ratings to raise black flags and surrender unconditionally. Both Sadar Patel and Mohammed Jinnah successfully persuaded the ratings to surrender. Jinnah in Calcutta and Patel in Bombay. Patel wrote, Discipline in the army cannot be kept temporary. We will want the army even in free India. So his concern was the army cannot be indiscipline. Even in a free India, we require the army. Mahatma Gandhi criticized the strikers for mutiny without the call of a preferred revolutionary party. There was no preferred revolutionary party. It was totally unprepared, it was absolutely spontaneous. And without the guidance and intervention of political leaders of their choice. He used the word very carefully, political leaders of their choice. Either Mahmoud Jinnah or Communist Party leader or Congress Party leader or whatever. He says political leaders of their choice should have been consulted before they went on strike. Mahatma Gandhi's views were a combination between Hindus and Muslims, which is what he wrote. A combination between Hindus and Muslims for the purpose of violent action is unholy. When he said Muslims and Hindus must come together, he said this kind of combination between Hindus and Muslims for the purpose of violent action is unholy and will lead to and would probably be a precursor to mutual violence back for India and the world. This is government. This is where we see the difference between any leader and government. It is to his own man, to his own countrymen he said this. Especially back for India and to the world, he always thought of everything. Sadar Balwai Patel, who was in Bombay, appealed to the agitators to give up violence and agreed to intervene only if they did so. He said, I will intervene, I will talk to the officers concerned, provided you surrender. You don't carry this forward anymore. The surrender. The issue remained unresolved till the morning of February 23rd when the hopeless situation produced a vote of surrender. Between the strikers, they conducted, they conducted their opinion and they voted for surrender because they knew there is a limit beyond which they can't go. On February 23rd, that is 18, they started 23rd, they surrendered. The negotiation moved fast, keeping in view the extreme sensitivity of the situation 
and most of the remarks of the strikers regarding welfare measures were considered impossible. And one important point is that on any forces mutiny, the punishment for the leaders is by death penalty. Death penalty. Nothing less than death penalty. Here, they said we will not pursue with any disciplinary action provided they go back. That was a, a great uh, sort of a political uh, decision taken then by Clementine. Immediate steps were taken to improve the quality of food served in the ratings teacher and their living condition. But these were followed up by court martials and all scale dismissal from the service. Though they said they did not take action, they took action, but not the action of uh, putting in jail or whatever. Some people are put in jail, like our friend here, Gabriel Bush, that is here, unfortunately he is not. He was put in jail. But others were court martial and large scale dismissal from the service. Khan and Singh were both dismissed. Khan went away to Pakistan and became some uh, level in uh, the Pakistan Navy, later the Pakistan Navy. But we do not know what happened later. None of those dismissed were reinstated. This is one of the promises that Royal Navy went back on, that they were not uh, reinstating anybody who was dismissed. British reaction. The British government clearly saw the writing on the wall. They realized that if the men of the defense forces could not be relied upon, then their hold on India would be very shaky. This was announced in English Parliament. It is recorded and you all can go and see in the net. It is available. All the recorded messages of that day it is clearly put there and Clementine also has agreed that once the forces are against us, we cannot have a hold on this country anymore. Political leaders they can come, but not the army people and Navy people. Also a hostile Navy would mean that the links with Britain would be severed. A hostile Navy is definitely going to cause a lot of harm. On the 19th February, a day after the naval mutiny broke out, the British government announced that a cabinet mission would come to India to work for the details of independence of the country from foreign rule. This is the birth of the cabinet mission which came. Otherwise, Britain did not want to give independence as most of you seniors know in August that they were keeping it for September or October, but everything was hastened and Mountbatten was sent. When Mountbatten was selected, the most unwise person in UK was Winston Churchill. So he said, you are going to stand on the demolition of an empire. That's what he gave the message. He refused to bless Mountbatten. And he said, you are going to stand for the demolition of an empire. So I can't bless you. I can't bless you. <coughs> in memoriam, you see, this is a memorial available now in Kolaba. A sailor standing with a sailing wheel. This to remember the mutiny. But when the memorial was erected in Bombay in 2002, 46 to 2002, our people did not think there was any necessity also. Forgotten men remembered only then. Madan Singh and B. Singh that have had ships named after them by the Indian Navy after 52 years after the incident. Madan Singh and B. Singh that both of them are remembered by naming of the two small ships. In 2002, Indian Navy also unveiled a memorial in honor of those leaders of the uprising, which stands in the B.C. Kolaba area of Central Mumbai today, what I told you. The credit, who should this credit go to? The credit for taking up the case for reorganizing, uh, recognizing the role of armed forces in the independence movement must go to Admiral Vishnu Bhagavad. I think uh, most of you all know about it, especially the conversation and how that all senior people are here. As CNS in 96-97 must have started in 96 the 50th anniversary of the incident, he had strongly taken up the case for recognition of the naval mutiny of 1946 and to treat the new winners as freedom fighters. Only Vishnu Bhagavad started this. There were great misgivings, misgivings within the Navy and their own Ministry of Defense did not agree to this. They said we cannot treat these sailors as freedom fighters. But he stood this idea, but he had his type of his own way. Authentic record, the most authentic and detailed story without any political overtones of the Oregon mutiny is in chapter 4 of the book under two ensigns, the Indian Navy 1945 to 1950 by Riyadh Satyendra Singh, it is something there. Satyendra Singh has written a book called under two ensigns, that is both British ensign and Indian ensign. Ensign is a flag of the armed forces, Navy especially, which has the St. George's cross and in the left hand top corner 
flag, the new uh, Catholic flag is embossed. This is that was taken into custody for painting J name on the platform at Chamaistalwa. At Chamaistalwa was the sole establishment. All that he did was, this is that did was, he wrote J name on the platform on which the Admiral Rappe was supposed to stand and take the salute of the people on that particular day. After his term in Nehri, he took the journalism. We see that took the journalism and joined for free press journal. He was also a disappointed man though. We see that is recorded his mama is in a book titled Mutiny of the Innocents. People were innocent. They were not able to creating any problem. They were innocent. They were not properly guided. He has given his personal views and feels that the mutineers were let down by the political leaders. At the end of the mutiny, no political leader of India took their case up. He feels that the mutiny was the final nail in the coffin of the imperial rule and an important stake in the freedom struggle, which is which has been agreed to even by Bernadette. According to him, the sailors were innocent, hence the title Mutineers of the Innocents. Mutiny of the Innocents. Important point by that is very important thing to note was Emma Khan is a Muslim from Bok Punjab who after participated in the Pakistan and Madan Singh is sick, tall and lean with these were the two leaders. One Hindu and one Muslim. Madan Singh said in Nair, he said no in Nair and later and he became an engineer and worked as an engineer there. He came to India and he is like old age. Some of the people have met him also. Both were under 25 when they joined the under 25 years of age and spoke English fluently. Their biggest to stand a strong point was they could in, uh, speak English because anybody joined the signal and branch had to know English in their English. Importantly, both were free of any communal rights. They did not have any communal rights. Later action. In 1972, the government of India addressed the chief secretaries of state governments of the Indian territories starting the ex-personnel of the Royal Indian Navy who had participated in the Aryan Mutiny would also be considered for the grant of Freedom Fighters Pension. I don't think Mr. Gabriel will get such a thing now. A list of 457 sailors of the Aryan who were discharged or dismissed or released from service as a result of Aryan Mutiny. There were three stages. Discharge means one can go and get a job. Dismiss means he cannot get a job anywhere. Released means he is discharged with disgrace, who cannot get anything out of Navy. And some of them can get a job other than the governments. From service as a result of our identity was prepared and subsequently 19 more sailors were added to this list, making a total of 476. By the time the benefits were available, many of them were already gone. This was approved by the government for implementation on June 1973. Jaira Gabriel, now our friend Jaira Gabriel, who was supposed to be here, he is past 85. He, he was unable to come. Mr. Andy Taylor was to bring him today, but unfortunately he fell ill and he could not come. Sir, so, see, Jaira Gabriel, born on 1st July 1925, exactly 85 years, uh, finished already. And in Kanagavalapuram, here, Tirvaldur, Tirvaldur joined Royal India Navy as a seaman at the age of 18. He specialized in underwater weapons such as torpedo, rocket launchers and mines. On 18 June 1946, he took part in the revolt against the British. His list is Gabriel, which we snapped on the day. In fact, we did not have a very good photograph though once they later on brought one. This was when Commodore Sater was honorary veteran seaman on the day. Proud to present two veterans. Today we are going to present our two veterans of Merchant Navy. One and two. The first one is Amir of Rao who is seated here, whom you all saw, who is a non Indian, and Archanda Rao, the son of Rukhani Rajkunda. The only living son of Rukhani Rajkunda. As you all know, this is Rukhani Rajkunda. <coughs> was a freedom fighter, first woman graduate in Madras, first woman to be elected to the legislative council, first woman to become a cabinet minister, all the first she had. And 
she married Lakshmi a doctor who had his, who had his uh, um, dispensary working and I think triple came in the same house where now it is called Bharti in Namu. And next to it there was a library. And Mr. Lakshmi had lost his wife by then. He had come to study medicine. He was shot at once, but his friend put him up, a Muslim friend put him up in his house. He studied medicine. And after that he put up practice. He had three clinics, three different places he had clinics. And he was both good in allopathy as well as Ayurvedic medicine, as you understand. And he used to go in his push bike from one place to another. So that in all the three clinics he will meet the patients and treat them. And the next door was a library where he met Rukmani, who was a lady, a uh, lady of a Vaishnava um, community of uh, Telugu Brahmins, dating from Madurai, her father was staying in Madurai, and they were here. When these two saw each other, that they were made for each other, they were married subsequently. Earlier, she was not allowed to study, but fortunately, there were great people who supported the family. And Veera Sarinkam, I don't know if you all know about Veera Sarinkam. Kandukuri Veera Sarinkam was one of the revolutionary Telugu poets, who has been mentioned by Subramani Bharti in his poem. He was there, he directed that this lady must be allowed to study, so she studied and taught and she took to national freedom struggle movement and joined the Congress. Her first son Sinuas Rao was born on the day Yemdan dropped her bomb in Madras, so she named him Yemdan Sinuas Unfortunately, he didn't live long, he died an infant. After which she bore four girls and then a boy who we were to honor today. Maybe we are, we are represented by his daughter here, who is also, I believe, named Rukmani. Yes, grandmother's name. And this gentleman, Archanta Damarao, joined the TS Deprinna Secretary. In one of the letters he records that his mother was in Telu prison undergoing the under British rule. When he was on board the government saluting Union Jack both in the morning and evening, because all the cadets have to salute Union Jack in the morning and evening. When asked why, she simply replied, India will soon get the freedom. We will be independent country. When we have an independent country, we need also people to work. So, I don't mind my son being in a training ship, she said. That is the kind of thing. And one of her daughters, as you all know, married the neurosurgeon Ramurthy, Indira Ramurthy. And of the Achan Ramurthy family, the uh, daughter of Achan Ramurthy married Sudesh Shamir, who captain again, to see the welcome great thing about in these two families. There were more than seven people in Navy, Mercedes. And Captain Suresh Amirapu is with us here. Therefore, both Amirapu and Anchanta became Sambandis anyway. And so we have all of them here very happily. And gentlemen, this is the thing that we have such people who have silently, without making a big show of anything, have been working for this great country of ours. A great country moves forward, not because of politicians and our leaders, but in spite of them, because of this huge force which moves like a temple cart. When it is moved, difficult to move. Once it is moved, it is difficult to stop also. That is India. So you see, this is Amirapu and that is Archangel So with this gentleman, ladies and gentlemen, I am finishing my talk. I will now request to start with Amir of Ramarao to give an account of his joining the ship and how he was shelled by a Japanese uh, bomber and how he was floating in the sea, squandered all over and was picked up and then admitted and then how he became and eventually 
He said he didn't leave the Navy because he was uh, floating for some time. He joined the Merchant Navy again. He rose to be the chief engineer, then later joined Indian Railways and controlled the two ships which are going in between Ceylon and India as the very superintendent of India Railways. So a great man we have now. I will request Amir Abdurrahman, please come. Unfortunately, at this age, at this age, it is a bit difficult for him to hear. So, there and whatever questions you need to ask, please ask Captain Suresh, who will be transmitting.
there are changes with pulling towards the left and give it a person as well. And the chief has to be and so the other ship hardly 72 hours. So I, I didn't even know my way around the ship. Anyway, the chief engineer got a tow rope parked on my right. We were able to reach uh, Falls Point, an island nearly 50 miles of Katak. So that night, we salvaged a lot of dry firewood and kept a rolling fire going because the place was uh, a jungle and there were hyenas around. Uh, Dr. Poison snakes also. Next morning, uh, enterprising boys climbed up the trees, dropped a few wild mangoes. What have you done that? And of course, some provisions were able to get, water to matches from the fire going. Then of course, uh, state government Orissa arranged for buses to get us to the hospital. All the local patients were all booted out to make room for all of us. I spent 13, 14 days in Calcutta, where our company surgeon had a look at it, recommended three weeks of outpatient and one month leave. At the end of that, I returned back in Bombay. That, that is all. Of course, the loss of life was very heavy. Nearly half our personnel, the ship was carrying uh, Royal Air Force personnel, whose job was to man. Uh, the aerodrome at uh, underground aerodrome at Mukyan, uh, Maldives. The Sultan of Maldives gave that island as a present to the British for the British in the war. So we were supposed to go there first half of Colombo. But I will not anywhere near Colombo. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
got some um, in the merchant area. And uh, like most well trained engineers at that time, they were extremely competent. It was very difficult uh, sailing in ships in those days uh, because they were all steam ships. And if you look at the actual working conditions uh, inside, uh, inside a, a, a engine room of a merchant vessel in those days, Four or five and boilers, and you know the, the document had to actually open and throw the thorn. Very much like those of you who are in the era, you have seen steam railway engines, but on a much, much larger, grander scale. So they were very tough working in those conditions for all of them, and uh, all these people went through it. And I can truly say that uh, my father and my father in law, and, uh, and I have several other relatives who are in this. Pioneers. They were the first generation of Indian merchantmen who took over, and amongst the many things that the British got a shout about when they left India, they thought the system could collapse, uh, but practically none of the institutions collapsed after the British left, and that included the Indian merchant navy. And uh, my father also most of his service so with an Indian company, which by the time the Indian company had begun to grow, uh, it was Cynthia Steam Navigation Company. And much later, uh, he chose to come ashore and he worked with the uh, Barry Company for many years um, in various establishments. And, you know, uh, he was in charge of the sugar mill. Uh, he was in charge of the sugar mill. That uh, also underscores the versatility of the marine engineer. Because, uh, you know, if a marine engineer was working on a ship, on a big machinery plant, uh, right there in the middle of the sea, he has to be an extremely versatile person. Uh, you know, the middle of the ship, as you see, many of the vegetarian consort, you can't open the yellow pages and call for any help. So, by nature, a marine engineer is, uh, you know, you find them, they are the skilled turners, the fitters, the uh, electricians, and they are, you know, very innovative engineers all rolled into one. And therefore, when these engineers, this extraordinary amount of uh, training that they received, uh, also stood them a very good stead. Itself, uh, had a very unique uh, phenomenon, and that is the training of the two branches, the nautical branch as well as the engineering branch, was both done together on the same ship. With the result uh, that people of uh, my father's generation or my father in law's generation were actually trained not merely in marine engineering, they had the elements of ship handling, they had elements of navigation, and all of it stood them with great scale, especially in the warlike situation. And of course, my father has recounted very briefly his experiences when he was shut down. And this happened off uh, sand you know, between Calcutta uh, and uh, what is now the uh, false point, that is the uh, Parami. But a lot of uh, other sailors who were also in the merchant navy, who were who ships were bombed, did not happen in such benign atmospheric conditions. One of my uncles was also a sailor, he was also bombed. And that happened in the wind wave, in the height of winter. And the majority of the people who died, not because of the bomb, but because of the hypothermia. The water was so cold, they died. And the people who lived were directly proportional to how quickly they were rescued. And by the time the boats, uh, the rescue boats went to the, the they were all flooding. But by the time they went to the last guys, it's too late. They all died of hypothermia. So in that sense, these were the numerous challenges that we faced, not only of, uh, from, uh, from war, and you can well imagine, you know, because at this point in time, when this particular attack took place, and my father forgot to tell you the date, actually, it was April 6th, 1946, when this particular attack took place. At that time, the Japanese had already had uh, control of a large amount of air weather. They were already in Burma, Singapore had fallen, Malaysia had fallen, um, they were uh, also Andamans had fallen. You know, Andamans, uh, that portion of uh, India which actually came under Japanese rule was, was the Andamans. So they had a full control over the air weather. And this particular convoy of ships uh, which left Calcutta. And the arrow, the irony is my father was not even supposed to be on the ship. He was already in some other vessel. And this convoy of ships is pulling out. And this particular ship, the Molda, on this particular ship, one of the engineers did turn up. Okay, it's on the shore. Uh, must have been run for one minute. He didn't turn up. The ship was about to sail. And therefore, at about 4 o'clock in the morning, the master 
started that one of these cable calls and it's total problem to have instructions for you. You pack your baggage immediately to follow me. And with the master sergeant's pass, you may all customs immigration every time thing. And he was immediately transferred and put on the ship to Malta. After that point, the Malta and the Malta could sail. And as he just mentioned, that is the reason why he was not familiar with any of the other people on the ship. Because he had hardly joined it just a few, uh, hardly two days ago. And thereafter, immediately after, as soon as the convoy left Sandheads, that's the time he attacked the place. So I think uh, uh, the larger story really is the inspiration that uh, people that, like him and from his generation, the sacrifices they have made, have already described them as a pioneering leader of uh, pioneering generation in this particular sector, which is the, the, the maritime sector. Uh, but that apart, I think as members of, uh, who saw the transition of India to a freer India, I think one of the reasons why uh, we are today at the end of 60 years for all the other nonsense that we see around us and the kind of wretched politicians that we have and the kind of society we have, if there is still a way of hope, it is largely because of, uh, I think, uh, the sacrifices made by a few uh, for the benefit of the many. And I think today we, uh, the, the, all the people who have been honored today are uh, examples of this. Gabriel, unfortunately, uh, he was not here. I attended the uh, earlier time when he was felicitated by the uh, NMF, the Center of uh, and I got a chance to listen to Mr. Gabriel's story in terms of time, which is uh, equally fascinating. And I can well imagine, uh, given the discipline of the armed forces that are there, for them to mutiny is, uh, you know, it, it must have been uh, quite, uh, quite an extreme provocation that they, that they went through. Rather than and I can very well understand the last slide that was shown where one of the mutineers actually described the beauty of the innocence. I think I can I could empathize with that particular phrase very well. So thank you. I'm happy that we shared these few words. And also before I sign off, uh, I think let's uh, think of the two great men uh, whose birthday today is today. Uh, one is of course Mahatma Elisa. Personally, I have been uh, deeply influenced by one of Said about the war. And more important, I think he was one of the most practical leaders. I've, if you see uh, a lot of leaders in the world who spoke the various you know, theories and, and uh, very free their advice, but Mahatma Gandhi was one of the few people who was, uh, I think, most practical. And uh, to me, nothing as embodies Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy more than the statement that he said, My life is my message. So I think that, uh, that is you know, the very black and unique thing. I think uh, most of us also forget that there was another great Indian who was also born today, uh, which was one of our earlier prime ministers, Mr. Lal Bahadur Shastri. Um, to his misfortune, he was born the same day as the Bhatma, and he gets somewhere mentioned in the dispatches. And he was, of course, not a uh, you know, charismatic politician, and probably had the misfortune of having to succeed. A very charismatic uh, politician like uh, the prime minister, like Mr. Nehru. But I think for those of us, I don't know, uh, people of my age over here might even recall that when Mr. Lalbal Shastri was the Prime Minister of the country, our economy, economic condition was much worse and we are actually going through a famine. And uh, Mr. Shastri as the Prime Minister had actually asked the citizens, citizens of the country to miss a meal. That was known as the miss a meal campaign. I think some of you who are grey hairs like me might remember that. Uh, it's called the miss a meal campaign. And every day on Monday, all over India, nobody ate dinner. As a, as a measure to save the food grains uh, that, that which was such scarcity at that time. And uh, he was one of the few politicians who, uh, when he was the railway minister, there was an accident. Without any provocation, he put his hand up and he was offered to resign, which is a complete contrast from uh, guys like Mr. Suresh Kalmadi, gang, who we see today. So that was that. And I think, uh, personally, uh, one of my regrets is that I was born after the Mahatma. I wish uh, I had my own lifetime got a chance to see him. And I keep, uh, you know, when I meet people of my Mahatma generation, I keep pestering them about any incidents that they had uh, where they met the Mahatma. In fact, I, I would like anybody here who's actually met the Mahatma to probably share this with us here. Okay, uh, thank you. With these few words, I hope I've uh, given you some insight into the contribution made by this year. Thank you. Why Tamil Parambarim and this what is this? What is this? I just say one minute. TSS.
the print, which is print all the AP print, came to the existence because Sir P. S. Swamiji here moved the resolution asking for a training ship to be established in 1922, not now, 1922. And it took four years for the government to decide, because it was non official resolution, nobody was giving any care to it. But again, he moved it later and he saw to it that this was made in Peru and the credit goes to P.S. Swamiji for ESSW. So, with this, I thank you all for having come this evening and particularly thank Anurakur Ramarao at this age of PC to come and be with us and thanks great for bringing him here and thank Mrs. Anurakur also to be with us today. And I understand Mr. Anjit Dev because he tried his best to bring our Jairaj, but he could not. And I thank the organizers of Tamil Parliament and I will go back to the Sir, Yeah, no, 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 no